Around eight years ago, I released a video about the Esperanto language in Esperanto. Last tempe, mi studas Esperanto iomete per Duolingo. I studied Esperanto for a couple of hours a day for about three weeks. Then I wrote a script in it, then filmed it in Esperanto. Two hours a day for three weeks. Does that mean I'm a language learning genius? No, it means Esperanto is simple. And I wasn't conversationally fluent, of course. I just knew enough to write a script in it and present what I had written. But I guess that's pretty good for three weeks of casual study. But let's back up for a minute. What is Esperanto? Many people say it's the easiest language in the world. In fact, it was designed to be just that. Designed? Yes, Esperanto is a constructed language, meaning it didn't arise naturally but was intentionally created. It was created by a man named Dr. L. L. Zamenhof, who published the first book about it in 1887. The book was released under the pen name Doctoro Esperanto, which means Dr. Hopeful One, and Esperanto took off as the name of the language. What exactly was he hopeful about? He was hopeful that this language would help promote international understanding and cooperation by transcending language barriers. He intended for Esperanto to become an international auxiliary language, meaning that it wouldn't replace anybody's native language, but that everyone could learn it in addition to their native language and use it to communicate with people from around the world. At first, it quickly started to gain a following, with the first World Esperanto Conference being held in 1905 and the founding of many Esperanto associations and publications. In 1920, the League of Nations introduced a proposal to use Esperanto as a language of diplomacy, and almost every delegate accepted the proposal, except for one, the French delegate. He used France's veto power to block the proposal. Why would he do that? French was a major language of international relations at the time, but was starting to decline. So France must have seen the adoption of Esperanto as a threat to its status and influence. Despite the loss of that major opportunity, the Esperanto movement continued to make progress, but it was seriously disrupted by the Second World War and the banning of Esperanto in all areas occupied by either Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. Esperanto didn't die, but it seems to me like the war destroyed much of its momentum. After the war, the United Nations chose its six official languages, English, French, Spanish, Russian, Mandarin, and Arabic. Notice that Esperanto isn't one of them. Esperanto was now highly unlikely to become a major international language, but its small community of enthusiasts has gotten a big boost with the rise of the internet. Websites like Lernu.net serve as valuable resources for learners, and Duolingo also has a course on Esperanto, which is currently being used by over 300,000 people. To put that in perspective, over 30 million people are currently using the Spanish course on Duolingo. So, Esperanto is not going to take over, but it's a language that brings joy to a global community of fans. Every Esperantisto knows Pasporta Servo, meaning passport service, a system for connecting with other Esperantistoi and meeting them in their home countries, and of course speaking Esperanto together. The internet has been a blessing to humanity because it makes the world smaller and brings communities of like-minded people even closer together. But the internet also has its dangers. And that brings me to the sponsor of today's video, Private Internet Access. Every time you log on to the internet, especially if you use public Wi-Fi in places like cafes, airports, and hotels, you're transmitting sensitive data that can be seen by internet service providers, invasive governments, and hackers. A VPN like Private Internet Access hides your IP address and encrypts your internet connection, protecting your privacy and data. Would you leave your smartphone unattended with the screen unlocked so anyone could pick it up and look at your notifications? Probably not. Well, using the internet without PIA is kind of like that. You're willfully allowing others to see your online activity. PIA is a VPN you can trust with a strict no-log policy, meaning that even PIA doesn't have your data, so they can't be forced to share it with anyone else. PIA is also invaluable for unlocking content on streaming services like Netflix that's only available in certain countries. When I was practicing the Indonesian language, for example, I used PIA to watch Indonesian films like Sang Kiai, or The Clerics in English, which isn't available in my home country. With PIA, you can switch between IP addresses in 84 different countries and all 50 US states. With just one subscription, you can use PIA on unlimited devices, and if you sign up using my link in the description, you'll get 83% off, plus four months for free. That brings it to just $2.03 a month, with a 30-day money-back guarantee, an incredible deal that you don't want to miss. Many thanks to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video.
Now let's get back to the Esperanto language and talk about some of its features. Esperanto was designed to be very easy to learn for as many people as possible. Its vocabulary is largely taken from major European languages, especially Latin and the Romance languages, Germanic languages, and to a lesser extent Slavic languages, Greek, and others. Zamenhof aimed to include words that were the same or similar in numerous languages, and tried to give the words forms that would be recognizable and memorable to as many people as possible. For example, there's the Esperanto word campo, which means field. In English there's camp, which now has a more specific meaning than field, but it's pretty easy to associate the meaning of field with a camp. In German there's kampf, which now means fight, but from the meaning of battlefield. In French there's champ. In Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese there's campo, or campu, and in Greek there's kambos, which refers to a plain, and so on. So, for speakers of any of those languages, the meaning of the word is either obvious, or there's a clear connection that makes the word easy to remember. Let's see that word in a sentence. Ili laboras en la campo. They are working in the field. Word for word, they work in the field. Ili. The word for they is similar to Latin, ili, which means they or those, and to its descendants in French, Spanish, Portuguese, etc. It seems that Esperanto has a tendency to prefer romance vocabulary when there's no word that's used across multiple families. Next is laboras. The root word is labor. This resembles the word for work in Latin and Italian, and the verb meaning specifically to plow or cultivate, in other words, to work the land, in Portuguese, Spanish, and French. And of course in English we have the word labor meaning work, both as a noun and as a verb. En is like en in Spanish, but also resembles the word for in in multiple Romance languages, as well as in Germanic languages, including English of course. La is the definite article, like the in English. It resembles one form of the definite article in Spanish, Italian, and French. Note that Esperanto doesn't have an indefinite article, like a in English. So this sentence is very heavily Romance based. But Esperanto also has a lot of words from Germanic languages and others. You might be thinking, aren't those all European languages? How is Esperanto supposed to be an international language when it's completely based on European languages? Yeah, that's one of the main criticisms of Esperanto, its Eurocentric features. But even if its vocabulary is less familiar to people in many non-European cultures, it's still quite an easy language to learn because of its very simple features. What makes it so simple? Well, all grammatical structures and rules are regularized, with basically no exceptions. Nouns. Singular nouns end in O after the root word. Domo. House. Libro. Book. Tago. De. Plural nouns are formed by adding J, pronounced Y, after O. Domoi. Houses. Libroi. Books. Tagoi. Days. Nouns have two cases, nominative, with no special case ending, and accusative, usually for the direct object, which has the case ending en. Domon, domoin. Libron, libroin. Tagon, tagoin. La libro esta sur la tablo. The book is on the table. Mi legas libron. I'm reading a book. Note that the stress in words with multiple syllables always falls on the penultimate syllable. In other words, the second to last syllable. Libro, estas, tablo, legas, libron. Adjectives. Singular adjectives always end in a. Granda domo, a big house. Bona libro, a good book. Plural adjectives end in j, like nouns. Grandai domoi, big houses. Bonai libroi, good books. In the accusative case, they end in n, just like nouns. She posedas du grandain domoin. She owns two big houses. Remember that the o suffix on nouns and the a suffix on adjectives are attached to the root word, so you can easily spot related words, like amico, meaning friend, and amica, meaning friendly, bono, meaning goodness, and bona, meaning good. Because the suffixes are completely predictable, you can easily guess how to say words you've never heard before if you know the root. Adverbs. Adverbs are formed by replacing a with e. Amica, friendly, becomes amike, in a friendly manner. Li parolis amike. He spoke in a friendly manner. Bona, good, becomes bone, well. Mi dormis bone. I slept well. Verbs. Verbs are not conjugated for person or number. Vi comprenas. I understand. Vi comprenas. You understand. Both singular and plural. Li comprenas. He understands. She comprenas. She understands. G comprenas. It understands. G is used for objects or animals. 
Ni comprenas, we understand. Ili comprenas, they understand. The verb is the same in each of these sentences. This is the root word, and as is the present tense verb suffix. There are a few different tenses and moods in Esperanto, and each one has its own suffix. To form the past tense, you use the suffix is. Li ne comprenis, he didn't understand. Word for word, he, no, understood. Note the simple way of negating sentences. You normally just use the word ne. Mi ne chatis la filmon. I didn't like the film. Word for word, it's I, no, liked, the, film, accusative form. To form the future tense, you use the suffix os. Mi pensas que ili comprenos. I think that they'll understand. Word for word, I, think, that, they, will understand. Mi esperas que ili chatos la filmon. I hope that they'll like the film. Word for word, I hope that they will like the film accusative form. You've probably noticed already that the syntax often mirrors the English syntax quite closely, but with some simplifications. Note the conjunction que that's used to introduce a subordinate clause with additional information, like that in English. It's based on the word que in Italian and que in French, Spanish, and Portuguese. To form the conditional mood, you use the suffix us. Mi irus se mi havus pli da tempo. I would go if I had more time. Word for word, I would go if I would have more of time. Notice that the conditional form is used in both verbs here, unlike in English. As a side note, notice the way to say more of something. Pli da. Pli da tempo. More time. Literally, more of time. Pli da mono. More money. Literally, more of money. The preposition da means of specifically for quantities. For other uses of of, the preposition de is used. To form the imperative, you use the suffix u. Donu al mi mian monon. Give me my money. Word for word, give to me my accusative form, money accusative form. To form the infinitive, you use the suffix i. Doni, to give. Iri, to go. Esperi, to hope. Li ne volas labori hodiao. He doesn't want to work today. Word for word, he, no, want, to work, today. You may have noticed that the personal pronouns more or less resemble the subject pronouns in various Romance languages, though me resembles an object pronoun. When they're used as object pronouns, you simply add the accusative ending, en. Li shatas shin, kai shi shatas lin. He likes her, and she likes him. Indirect objects are expressed using a preposition. Mi donis al li la shlosilon. I gave him the key. Word for word, I gave to he the key, accusative. In this word for word translation, I'm using the word he to show that the pronoun is the same as the nominative pronoun. Possessive pronouns and possessive adjectives are formed by adding the adjective suffix a to the pronoun. Mi becomes mia, mia frato, my brother, via fratino, your sister, lia patro, his father, shia patrino, her mother, nia filo, our son, ilia filino, their daughter. And if this noun phrase is accusative, it takes the n suffix. She amas shian patrinon. She loves her mother. Notice how feminine nouns can be derived from masculine nouns with the suffix in, which is then followed by the noun suffix o. This is only for natural gender of humans and animals. Bovo, bull. Bovino, cow. Coco, chicken. Coquino, hen. But Esperanto has no grammatical gender. A word like tasso, meaning cup, has no gender. Now let's look at some greetings and other basic phrases in Esperanto. Saluton. This is the typical Esperanto greeting, like hello. It might remind you of French, salut, Spanish, saludo, Italian, saluto, or English, salutations. Notice that it's a noun in the accusative form. Why? Well, it literally means greeting, and it's like saying, I'm giving you a greeting. The greeting is the object of an action. Qui al vi fartas? How are you doing? Word for word, how, you, fare. The verb here is the present tense form of farti, to fare, or to be doing. In other words, to be in a certain condition. Don't confuse this verb with the verb fari, which means to do in its usual sense. Mi fartas bone. I'm doing well. Remember that bone is the adverb meaning well, and bona is the adjective meaning good. Dankon. Thanks. The root word here is dank which is like thank in English, or danke in German, and similar words in other Germanic languages. It's a singular noun, and like saluton, it's in the accusative case. Why? Because it's like saying, I give you my thanks. 
The following greetings are also in the accusative. Bonan matenon, good morning. Mateno resembles the word for morning in French, matin, and Italian, mattina. Bonan tagon, good day. Again, we see the word tago, which resembles the word for day in German, tak, Dutch, dag, Swedish, dag, and so on. Bonan vesperon, good evening. Vespero doesn't resemble many words I'm familiar with, but it does resemble the word for evening in Catalan, vespre. Ĉu vi parolas la francan? Do you speak French? Word for word, question marker, you speak the French. Notice that the letter C is pronounced S in Esperanto, but when it has the diacritic above it, it's pronounced CH. To form a yes or no question in Esperanto, you add the question marker CHU to the beginning of the sentence. The names of most languages are preceded by the definite article LA, but not Esperanto. Chu vi parolas Esperanton? Do you speak Esperanto? Yes. Ne. Kion vi volas? What do you want? Word for word, what, accusative form, you want. Kio is the question word meaning what, and here it's in the accusative form. Volas is the present tense of voli, and resembles the French verb meaning want, vouloir, the Italian verb, volere, and German, wollen, which is related to English, will. Mi chatus glasson da ruja vino. I'd like a glass of red wine. Word for word, I would like glass of red wine. Notice that the verb chatus is in the conditional form. Qui estas la stazidomo? Where's the train station? Word for word, where is the train station? Qui is the question word meaning where. Estas is the present tense of esti, the verb meaning to be. The word for train station, stazidomo, is a compound word of stazio, meaning station, and domo, meaning house. Mi sentas min felicia hodio. I feel happy today. Word for word, I feel myself happy today. Sentas is the present tense form of the verb senti, meaning to feel. It resembles the verb meaning to feel in numerous Romance languages. It's followed by min, the accusative form of the first person singular pronoun. But here it's used as a reflexive pronoun to show that you're feeling something within yourself. Felicia is the word for happy, which again resembles the word for happy in a number of Romance languages. Kia lo ne diras, I don't know, en Esperanto. How do you say, I don't know, in Esperanto? Word for word, how one says, I don't know, in Esperanto. Oni is an impersonal pronoun, like one in English, that refers to people in general. Diras is the present tense of diri, which means say. Oni diras minestias. You say minestias. Word for word, one says, I know no. Scias is the present tense form of the verb sci, meaning to know. It comes from the Latin verb scire, meaning to know. And the English word science also comes from a related Latin noun. Let's take a closer look at the name of the language, esperanto. The root of the verb is esper which means hope, similar to the verb for hope in Romance languages like French, Spanish, and Portuguese. The O suffix tells us that this is a noun. Then there's the other suffix, ant, after the root. This is a present active participle suffix, which gives the word an adjectival meaning. Here, something like hoping. But it needs an additional suffix to tell us what part of speech it is. A to make it an adjective, E to make it an adverb, or O to make it a noun. Esperanto is a noun. Esperanta is an adjective. Mi estas esperanta. I'm hopeful. Esperante is an adverb. Mi nur sidas chitie esperante que io helpos min. I'm just sitting here hoping someone helps me. Word for word, I only sit here hoping that someone will help me. Accusative. Here, esperante is an adverb because this whole clause is describing more about the action of sitting. These three words are all based on the present active participle. There are also past active participles, with the suffix int, and future active participles, with the suffix ont. For intransitive verbs like esperi, these are all the forms. But for transitive verbs, there are also present, past, and future passive participles too. La domo estas construata. The house is being built. The verb esti indicates the time, and the passive participle indicates whether the action is in progress, complete, or about to be done. In this sentence, it's in progress. La domo estas construita. The house is built. Here, estas is still in the present tense, but this is the past passive participle, so the action is complete. La domo estas construota. 
the house is about to be built. This is the future past participle. But the verb esti could be in the past. La domo estis construata. The house was being built. La domo estis construita. The house was built, meaning it was already complete. La domo estis construota. The house was about to be built. And the verb esti could also be in the future, but I'll skip that for now. In my opinion, these participles are the one thing that stands out as a little difficult in Esperanto. When you first discover them, it's like, wait, I've been tricked. They said this would be easy. Well, the participles require effort and practice, but the verbal system of Esperanto is still quite simple compared to most natural languages. Ne crocodilu, au vial frontos terurain sequoin. Don't crocodile, or you will face dire consequences. Word for word, no crocodile, imperative form, or you will face terrible consequences. Crocodile? What do you mean by crocodile? Crocodili is a verb used by Esperanto speakers to refer to the use of other languages in an Esperanto-speaking context. For example, if you join an Esperanto meetup but you walk around speaking English, or even worse, French, then the other attendees might just snap. Esperanto speakers believe in global harmony, peace, and tolerance, unless you crocodile. Then you better run for your life. It's no secret that I've trolled the Esperanto community numerous times throughout the history of this channel. Good evening and welcome to the Lang Focus channel. This is a quick video to bring you some breaking news from the linguistic world. According to recently released documents, the European Union will soon be adopting Esperanto as an official language. But the truth is, I think Esperanto is pretty cool. Whenever you start to learn a new language, there's a feeling of excitement and elation that comes with the initial stages of rapid learning. But that feeling fades as your learning slows. But with Esperanto, that feeling doesn't really fade, because without any complicated structures or exceptions, you maintain a rapid pace of learning. It's a lot of fun. The only problem is that it's not widely used outside of the small Esperanto community. So, I don't practice Esperanto very often. I would also say that learning Esperanto doesn't give you the experience of unlocking the door to an authentic culture that you can fall in love with. There's a community and a movement, but I wouldn't say it's a culture. So to me it doesn't feel like as deep of an experience as learning a natural language. But since it's an auxiliary language, maybe that's the point. It doesn't belong to any culture or country. If you know some Esperanto, what's been your experience in learning it? And to other people, what's your impression of Esperanto? And as always, a special thanks goes out to all of the LangFocus Patreon supporters, especially the ones whose names appear on the screen. They're the top tier Patreon supporters, so many extra special thanks go out to them. If you're interested in constructed languages like Esperanto, check out this video on Tokipona I made a few years ago. It's totally different from Esperanto, but equally interesting. 